Welcome, friends. We're glad you've chosen to join us in our study today of the Holy Scriptures. We're studying today an important section in the life of the Apostle. Acts, the 19th chapter, tells of the abrupt end of Paul's work in Ephesus. He had been there approximately three years. But certain silversmiths that made images of uh, the goddess Diana had created a riot, and it became necessary that Paul leave that city. But while Paul left that city at the conclusion of that riot to spare his life, it was not as though that he had not made plans, for for some time he had been planning things that he was going to do. And so, when the riot occurred and he left from the city of Ephesus, he put into motion those uh, conclusion of those plans and it began a journey that would lead him toward the city of Jerusalem. What Paul was concerned about was a wish that had been expressed to him some years before, eight or ten years, by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. When Paul and Barnabas had begun these journeys, of which Barnabas made one with Paul, and Paul made three, when they had made their one journey together, they reported to the church in Antioch that had sent them out. And while they were there, brethren from Jerusalem, Jewish brethren, came and troubled the church in Antioch. These were Judaizing teachers. They believed that Gentiles were ones that had to be circumcised and keep the law if they were going to be accepted as a part of this new order, the church. It troubled the church in Antioch. This was contrary to the things that the Apostle Paul had been teaching, and much contention was with these individuals in the church in Antioch. Antioch as Paul and Barnabas, if they would go up to Jerusalem to the elders that were there, or to the apostles that were there before them. And so they did. And Acts, the 15th chapter, is the story of those events and how that problem was solved. But Galatians, the second chapter, likewise is parallel. It doesn't tell about the decisions that was made in regard to the Jews and the Gentiles, and that the Gentiles were not compelled to, to keep the law or to accept circumcision. Rather, it tells about some interactions that the apostle Paul had had with the apostles that were before him in Jerusalem. There was some question in the hearts of some about Paul and his authority as an apostle. So he met with these apostles, and as he met with them, it was evident from the meeting of Paul with the apostles that were before him. Yes, he was one that was ever much an apostle as they. And yes, Christ had given him the authority to be the one that was the apostle to the Gentiles. That was evident. They could add nothing to anything that Paul taught, nor could they find any reason to say that he missed some of the things he did teach. But rather, when they saw that God had given to them this ministry, that is, to Paul and Barnabas, they gave to Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And that was that they were to be ones that were to go to the Gentiles and the apostles would go to the Jews. There was just one wish that these brethren expressed, and that's found in Galatians, the second chapter, and verse 10. These brethren said, Only they would that we should remember the poor, which very thing I was also zealous to do. So here was something that the brethren that were in Jerusalem expressed a wish to Paul, that Paul would remember these that were poor in Jerusalem. The Christians in Jerusalem made great sacrifices to spread the gospel. And they had impoverished themselves by the things that they had done. And so already Paul had helped in ministering to these brethren, Acts the 12th chapter, the end of it tells of a contribution already made for these Jerusalem Christians by the church at, uh, in uh, uh, Antioch. But now, some years later, perhaps 20 or 25 years later, Paul is making a second effort at helping these brethren. The effort that he makes there 
is far more broad than it was earlier. And we notice that he had been in the last few months that he was in Ephesus. He had been doing all that he could to stir the brethren toward making a generous and sizable contribution for these Christians that were in India, in Jerusalem. And we find that he'd been busy. The three major letters that Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans, touches on this issue. And already, as Paul is ending his work in the city of Ephesus, he has received assurance and letters he's written to others urging to him. He's written to the churches of Galatia. He's written not only to the Church of Galatia, he's had contact with the, the Corinthian brethren. And the, the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, reminds them that what he had told the brethren in Galatia was that that they should do upon the first day of the week. Each of them were to lay by in store as they prospered, that no gatherings would be made when he came. He had written to them, and uh, he had likewise uh, had uh, obtained help and assurance from Macedonian churches they wanted to help. And so, as the apostle is gathering these funds together, he has the assurance of uh, churches in Galatia, in Decaia, where Corinth was, in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and in Ephesus itself. And as we look in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, we find a company of seven men that are named. And each of these four districts are mentioned. And these men join Paul and Luke, and they make their way to the city of Jerusalem. And as they go, wherever they go, there is a warning, a dire warning that is given by prophets in those churches to Paul telling Paul, bonds and afflictions abide you. Jerusalem was a dangerous place for Paul to be. In his going to that city after his conversion, there was a plot made against him by Jews, and he found it necessary to leave with the urgings of the apostles and the elders there. So he left. It was a dangerous place for him. It was dangerous because uh, while many Jews did believe, uh, there were multitudes that did not believe. They did not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. And uh, persecutions had uh, arose. Paul had initiated this as uh, the, he consented to the death of Stephen, Acts the seventh chapter. Uh, but that animosity persisted. And uh, when Paul left the ranks of disbelievers and became a believer. And his ardent intentions and efforts was that that had caused many, many, many Jews to embrace the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. The animosity of disbelieving Jews only intensified. And bonds and afflictions were waiting for Paul. And wherever he went, as he and these Brethren who traveled with him, messengers of churches, carrying the bonds from these churches wherever he went. Prophets and churches that they visited along the way, said Paul. Bonds and afflictions await you in the city of Jerusalem. And as we look at that, we find one of the most graphic thoughts and expressions of that in the 21st chapter. Paul, with his company, reached Caesarea, the home of Philip, who had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And there, a prophet by the name of Agabus, whom Paul had apparently met before, came there. And he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet, since the Holy Spirit says uh, that such is one. If this is going to happen to the one that owns this girdle, this is going to be what the Jews do to him when he gets to Jerusalem. If the brethren before had not been concerned, they were electrified by this. And all of them began to plead with Paul, and that included Luke and others, don't go to Jerusalem, but he was determined he was going to go. He said, what do you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die at Jerusalem, the name of my Lord. Why? Why would the apostle go 
knowing that bonds and afflictions abide him. And how are we to look at the instructions that uh, were given to him by the prophets in the very churches of the matter of bonds and afflictions that awaited him? Some individuals think that Paul obeyed or disobeyed God, that he actually refused to do what God warned him not to do. I do not accept that view. I do not believe the apostle disobeyed God. I think that the warnings were just that, that if Paul went, he didn't go blindfolded. He went with his eyes open, knowing what was going to be his fate. And the warnings were to let him know in no uncertain terms, this is what's going to happen to you. And yet he went anyway. Why? Well, there are several reasons for it. And one was of the fact of the importance of this contribution. The Apostle Paul had written his letter to the Romans in Corinth. This was the last of these three major letters, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans. And it was in Corinth that he purposed with those messengers that were with him to travel from there to carry this contribution. But we find that while he intended, though, once more a plot was laid against his life by the Jews and he found it necessary to cancel that ship and that trip by sea and travel back over land, doubling back through some of the churches, Corinth, and then back to Macedonia, and ultimately visiting the city that he left a few weeks before or a few months before in Ephesus. But when he was in Corinth, he wrote to the church at Rome, and he mentioned his contribution. And then he asked for Roman brethren something that often we do, and you perhaps do, is that you ask in a special need individuals to join you in prayer that your needs might be filled. And that is proper, and that is right. And we know so because Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, and he said, pray for me. And pray that this gift is that will be something that will be something that will be acceptable to the saints, and that I'll be delivered from the disobedient that were in uh, Jerusalem. Paul had written and said that this contribution from these Gentile churches was something that would fill up the needs of these disciples. It would fill their physical need, but more than that. It was something else that Paul anticipated, and that was he prayed to that Roman brethren would ask that this contribution would be acceptable to the saints. You see, this contribution would serve somewhat as a bridge between those that were Christians among the Jews and those that were Christians among the Gentiles. The animosity was evident between these two nations, and it didn't always cease when both uh, individuals from both nations became Christians. And it was to serve somewhat as a bridge between these individuals to make their feelings of one in Christ something that was not just something that was spoken in word, but was something that was in deed. When Paul had written to the Romans, he said in Romans that uh, I could wish myself anathema for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. But Paul could not. He couldn't be anathema to save the Jews. Jesus had died for all men. He had died for the Gentiles. He died for the Jews. And the Galatian writer said that he became a curse for them. But while that blood was there and pardon was freely available, not all individuals partook of it. They didn't share in it. And when Paul said, I could wish myself anathema, the fact if Paul had been lost, that would not save one single unbelieving person, Jew or Gentile. But Paul loved his nation. He wanted this harmony between Jew and Gentile to exist. He wanted his brethren that did not believe to become a bit of believers. And while he did not give his life to save the individuals that were lost, there is a sense in which that when he was one that was arrested, 
taken to Jerusalem or to Rome, from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and then to Rome, that Paul spent many years in prison because that he was determined that he would see that this gift was offered to the Jewish Christians. We thank you for listening. In our next session, in our next lesson, we're going to discuss a question that is very intently asked today. Are the Jews the chosen people of God? We hope you'll be listening next week. We hope you'll tell others about it. But now, we commend you to God, to the word of his grace. Thank you.